Aloha, everybody. I am so touched. I can't believe that you would say that on your own like that. Every week you encourage me. Thank you so much. We are in Galatians 4. Let's open up in a word of prayer and ask the Spirit of God to teach us. We say that every week, but you'd be in big trouble if it was just me teaching. We want the Holy Spirit to enlighten us and to uh, instruct us, find some application today that he would impress upon our hearts. So let's invite him to do just that. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us again. And then you would be that teaching voice that we would hear because you know us intimately and you fill us and indwell us. And there are wonderful ways that you will nudge us and encourage us, maybe even a rebuke, but we want to hear truth from you. So we receive that now in Jesus name. Amen. When we were setting up this morning, guys and I were talking about uh, this announcement that came out that Mike Tyson, the boxer, yeah. is planning to fight again. Yeah. And he's 57 years old. And I don't know the guys, I think his name is Jake, uh, that he's fighting, but he's decades younger. Um, so it's, you know, the hype and the promo, and, and uh, I think it's in July. So. Uh, a, I don't care how old Mike gets, I never would want to be in a ring with him. Uh, but I grew up kind of uh, interested in boxing. My dad boxed in the Navy, and, and so uh, I never boxed, you know, formally. We'd mess around as kids. But I remember uh, when I was uh, playing water polo for the very first time at 15, I didn't know what the game was about, and they said, hey, sign up for this. You can swim all the time and uh, you'll love it. And so I, I'm in the middle of summer, I just registered for high school. I jump in the water and instantly you're in a fight. Yeah. You know, they're punching and grabbing below the water and all the things you don't see. And so I responded and I remember going to my dad and I go, dad, I think I might need to know some of those boxing skills that you learned in the Navy. My dad was actually the champion of his ship uh, for years. He went to different ships and so he boxed quite a bit. So uh, he said, uh, gave me some advice, and uh, I, I asked, he, he said, always keep your guard up, you know, as one, which is hard to do when you're treading water. Uh, but he said, um, if you don't, you'll get hit. I said, well, why did you quit boxing? He goes, I got tired of being hit. And I said, he goes, this one guy hit me three ways, you've heard this before, fast, hard, and continuously. And that's when you decide to say, I want to do something else. Well, one of the things you're going to learn with this illustration today is this whole theme of Paul speaking to all these churches in the Galatia region is to keep your guard up. And they had not done that. They had dropped their guard. And as a result, these false teachers had come up and really sucker punched them into this reality and really dazed them pulling them away from the simplicity of their faith in Christ alone and starting to add legalism to. And sometimes we will say, oh yeah, that was a, a bad season for those churches of Galatia. It happens all the time today. Some churches will pull you into a legalistic thing where, where you have to do this and you have to be a part of this and you have to sign here and you have to give this much and we don't do this and we don't do that and that's how you're, uh, you become a Christian. Or it's fine that you received Christ when you did, but you need to also add this to it. So they had been sucker punched repeatedly, and they were now dazed and confused as a result. And as uh, the aftermath is what we're reading about is this caring pastor who planted these churches is addressing these issues. And it, it is um, very personal. It's theological at times as we've been working through the book but it's not so far away from where we live. So I'm gonna invite you to drop down to verse 12 now. And if you missed some of the past uh, studies there on our YouTube channel, you can start from chapter one. But listen to where he starts as he is literally speaking from his heart to these people who have been dazed now. The verse starts out brethren, and he still considers them brethren. They're his brothers and sisters even though they've gotten confused. That's a good reminder for us, isn't it? See a brother that's strayed or something else. Still a brother, and we have to 
treat them with love, but never compromise on truth. That's what Paul does here. Brethren, I urge you, there's your urgency. I urge you to become like me. Quite a statement, isn't it? I urge you, remember their condition. They're, they're way out there. They've been added, uh, they, they've been uh, brainwashed into this legalism. And so we say, now I urge you to become like me. Interesting statement, isn't it? Was it that Paul was perfect? No, way. he admits that he's not. He admits to his own sin. But when he uses that term, it's not that he has a sense of perfection or sinlessness uh, or, or that he is sinless. It is saying, become like me in my example. Another way to say it, and we should be able to say this as well. Follow me as I follow Christ. Not that I won't bump, trip, fall. You follow me as your pastor, you'll see the bumps and the trips and the falls. All of us do that. But we're following Christ and we're repenting and we're confessing and we're growing. That's what he's inviting them to do. You've gotten sucker punch and you're in a dazed, confused world. I'm telling you to become like me where you will follow Jesus the way that I do. And one thing that Paul had in his walk with the Lord was consistency. He was faithful to consistently follow the Lord no matter what he was going through physically, mentally, or emotionally. He was consistent. And he's saying, you can't stray off the course. You need to follow Christ and let me be your example as you do. <clears throat> follow me. I urge you to become like me for I became like you. And that's his lovely way of saying, I've been where you're at. I was a legalist. I was the Jew of Jews. And I was the one who followed all the legalism of Judaism. So I know where you're at. I became like you. I can relate is what Paul is saying. And watch as we continue with this. There will be this confrontation of tr with truth, but always in a loving attitude, although it's very personal. I urge you to become like me for this reason. I was where you were at. I became like you. I used to be like you are now. I know where you're at. You have, and he makes a statement, you have not injured me at all. In all of this falling away and in their condition, he wants them to know you, that he is not injured by what they've done in the sense of you have not hurt my feelings. Sometimes when people are confronted, they feel like if they, if they get a response, they feel like, oh, I, the guy's just saying that because I hurt his feelings. He said, this is not about emotions. This is not about my feelings. You've not injured me at all through that way. You haven't hurt my feelings. Verse 13 you know, and now he's going to go back and talk a little bit about the introduction of their relationship, how they grew together and how he first met them. So first of all, you haven't hurt my feelings. That's not what this about is about. But then watch how he takes them back to where they first started. And by the way, that's a good thing to do now and then, right? Remember Andre Crouch's old song, Take Me Back? Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first believed you. That's good to do now and then. And that's kind of what Paul is doing for them. This is a water break. I drove through Dunkin' Donut. No, I did not get a donut. I paid 79 cents for a cup of water. They go, you know, we have to charge you. And I said, okay, because I was thirsty. But I'm going back for a refill. Um... So here he goes, take me back. You know that because of my physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. Let's go back to where we first met. And when you first met me, I first met you, I, I had a physical infirmity. Now, if you know uh, how this is treated in the, the uh, accounts of the book of Acts and some of his other letters, there's all kinds of speculation what that would be, but Paul never says it. So to even guess, 
you know, it's just speculation. So you'll, you'll see even in this passage that a lot of people go, oh, it was his eyes. For sure it was his eyes. Some people think he was up in this region because he had malaria, um, stomach issues, depression, all kinds of things. May have been all of those things, but whatever it was, he was experiencing this physical infirmity when he first preached the gospel to them. And that's why he was in their region, probably to get some healing or some treatment, but that's where they met. And so he's kind of saying, hey, when I met you, I was a mess physically. Do you remember that? Because sometimes we forget. Do you remember how, how messed up I was physically? And that's where we first met. That's where our relationship began. I preached the gospel to you then. And my trial, again, referring to this physical infirmity, my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject. Whatever that was, whatever that handicap or that disease was, they didn't despise him for it. I mean, he could have looked terrible. He could have been a burden on them, depending on how bad it got. And apparently by some of his writings, it got very bad. But whatever it was, they didn't despise him for it. As a matter of fact, their relationship built out of it. Isn't that beautiful? someone that might be rejected out of an illness or a mental situation or whatever it is, weren't rejected. In this case, Paul says, I wasn't rejected for it, but instead you cared for me, you loved me. As my trial, which was in my flesh, you didn't despise or reject. That's a beautiful thing when people come to Christ and the community of Christ grows is to have the compassion and the love and to walk through trials with people, whatever they are. Paul felt that from them. So you haven't hurt my feelings. Um, it's not about that. We, we were built on a beautiful relationship of compassion. You didn't reject me, but instead you, middle of verse 14 there, you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. The very opposite of reject, you respected. And you received me, and he uses the term, received me as an angel. That word, as you know, is messenger. You received me as a messenger of God, even with the authority, even as Christ Jesus. In other words, you received me as the authority spokesperson for Christ Jesus, just as you would have received Christ Jesus if he came and told you these things. So there was this respect and this compassion and this uh, understanding of his authority that he never forced on them, but they accepted say, he's bringing us God's word. It's like the way we treat the Bible. Those of us who believe in the authority of the Bible and how, how we teach here is that I'm in awe that God would want to speak to me. I want to study it. I want to learn even in this passage what God has for me. That's kind of how they received him. So this difficult situation of his physical flesh and whatever that was, some people would just say, I don't want anything to do with that guy. But instead they received him as a messenger of God, even with the authority of Christ. So the foundation is laid again. That's where we started. Now remember, they've strayed over a period of times and fallen victim to these false teachers, but he's bringing them back to that. So here comes some of the questions that Paul has for them. Verse 15. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? You loved me. You got some solid teaching. I'm reflecting. Can you reflect back? What was the blessing that you enjoyed? Go back to that respect. Go back to that love where God was ministering to you through me. And he's not just appealing to the personal relationship, although that's part of it, but to that authority of God. Don't you remember the respect and the love? For I bear you witness that if possible, here's where you were with me, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. You're symbolic, of course, 
but you are you were so respectful so much in love with the word of god that i brought you as a messenger you would have symbolically even pulled your eyes out to give them to me by the way that's one of the verses people use is hell see it was bad eyesight for paul not that we're going to help him by pulling our eyes out right <laughs> but again all speculation throughout but he goes you had that that willingness to lay your life down for me and to see where they are now is just shocking to Paul. But he's lovingly trying to pull them back. You met people like that in your Christian journey? Full of zeal and enthusiasm and walking with the Lord years ago? Maybe you'll bump into them in town or on Del Mar or something and go, what happened to that person? They used to be so fervent with the Lord. A lot of times I ask myself, no, well, who got in their face? Who got in their mind? Who, who got into their theology and messed them up? Because they used to walk so solidly with Christ. And now they're not. That's his dilemma. He says, listen, you respected, you loved. And I'm bearing witness, if possible, uh, what you would have shown me in that love, what you would have given for me, and here's the burning question, verse 16. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? That's how we're often viewed. You choose to confront somebody in love with the truth. You are labeled as an enemy. And our society's gone that way. The big distance with church and the Bible and a relationship with Christ has become the enemy of society many times. Because as we hopefully lovingly and gently preach truth, they say, I don't want to hear that. That's unloving. Or you're my enemy. Uh, you're, you stand against me and my choices and my decisions. Paul's lovingly reminding them where they came from, but he's not going to dissipate from the truth. So we always come back to this in our faith, sharing the truth in love. We can't become angry Christians. We can't be uh, to a family member or to a stranger or to someone at work, that angry person, you know, because we have all these differences. We never compromise on truth, but we have to do it in love. There's a man of God that I respect greatly that's under fire right now for his advice on the whole gay wedding issue and a, a respected man, Alistair Begg, many of you know him, Scottish pastor, and he had given some advice to uh, some call-in person and uh, encouraged them to go to uh, this gay wedding, it's a relative, and even bring a present just to show love. And the controversy is coming to saying, boy, as much as I respect this pastor, you're saying I you're showing a, a support of something that God speaks very much against throughout scripture. And even though it's a relative and it's a difficult thing, you don't love me, you won't come to this. It's a difficult subject matter in our day and age. But if we're not standing for truth and we're saying, oh, that's okay. And I endorse it when well, the Bible is very clear, the consequences. So you have great men of God even I don't know if he's struggling with the issue or what, what the latest is, but you're going, man, this is so hard to watch in our day and age as we compromise truth in the name of love. You don't have to compromise either. You never compromise the truth of what scripture says, but you always do it in love. I know that's a difficult situation for you, but you have this conversation. I love you regardless, and I hope to show that, but I can't, can't compromise truth. And this is what Paul's doing to them. In their day and age, the issue was legalism. And it was warping their view of their salvation. It was diminishing what Christ did on the cross. And as a result of it, they were strained. And he goes, how is it that I become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. Matter of fact, the worst thing we can do is pretend like things are okay and not tell the truth when it will really harm somebody. How have I become your enemy? Watch as he goes on here. Truth is not always comfortable. And he says, they, referring to these zealot uh, legalists, they court you. And as they court you, 
they do it for no good. Yes, they, they want to exclude you or draw you away from truth and my teaching, the Bible's teaching, Paul says. They, they seduce you, they court you, but it's not for good. They do it zealously, but that's a zeal for the wrong reasons. And yes, they even want to exclude you, draw you away, isolate you, that you may be zealous for them. It's the classic cultic approach that used to be done in the 60s and 70s, still done today. The uh, term that used to be used was love bombing where someone is searching and they get their group of people in a cult just to surround that person. It used to happen at our beaches right here, still does. But all through Huntington Beach, all the, the children of God were the big cult of the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And they would love bomb people. And someone would be mad at their parents and they will come into our group and we'll feed you and we'll take care of you and we'll love you. And they just surrounded them in the name of religion, singing some of the same songs we would sing. Back when I was a child, I went to the Huntington Beach Four Square Church, which a couple years before, Pastor Chuck pastored. I didn't know that. I was a young boy. Uh, and then uh, Gary Robinson had followed him. When our family went there, it was Pastor Gary. But uh, David Berg, the founder of the Children of God, his mother attended that church. We called her Mother Berg. I thought it was Mother Bird when I was a child. It was Mother Berg. <laughs> Remember saying, I, I didn't know till later on when I read all the history of the children of God, who she was. She was a solid believer, but her son went wacko. So the children of God grew to be such a, a huge cult in the 70s and still ramifications. And um, there was a book years ago called Let My Children Free. And that was by Ted Patrick, who uh, had his a son was exposed to that group and he became a deprogrammer. They literally go in and kidnap these kids if they were, you know, of a certain age and uh, spend a few days with them to deprogram them from all the, the uh, brainwashing that had taken place. Starts with love bombing, but then they want all your money. And then they want you to denounce everything else but the cult. The tactics are the same. And that's what he's saying here. They zealously court you, but for no good, Yes, they want to exclude you, draw you away, and they'll do whatever they can to do it, but their zeal is for themselves. Beware, as Paul continues to say, pick up your guard again. You're getting knocked out by these people. And he inserts this, and of course, Paul would know this, verse 18. It is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I'm present with you, He's not knocking zeal. Matter of fact, you can read Paul's own testimony. And he said, I was the most zealous among them. But guess what he was zealous for? Killing Christians. Before his transformation. Before he came to Christ. So zeal, leaning in the right direction, can be a good thing. We want to be zealous for Christ. But in a good way. But it can be a dangerous thing as well when it goes to the bad things. And the cults have mastered that, as we mentioned. It's good to be zealous in a good thing, always, and not only when I am present with you. Watch here as the passage ends. We'll go up to verse 20 here. But watch the tenderness and now the metaphors that he uses to remind them that though all this has happened, he still loves them. He's still their shepherd. He even shifts into kind of the parenting role. So he says in verse 19, my little children, that's a very tender way. He's just hit them with truth and he's called them out. Why do you call me your enemy? I'm just trying to help you. And then he uses this very tender term, Jesus would use it, little lambs, my little children, a very tender, affectionate title. My little children, and then here's the metaphor. For whom I labor in birth again. It's as if Paul is saying, I, I birthed you in your new walk with Christ. I, I, I gave you life in Christ. And now 
I, I'm doing it again with all this discussion, with all this confrontation, I'm having to go through, as it were, labor pains again to birth you again until Christ is formed in you. Until you have this right concept that Christ came to set you free from this and that Christ loves you and wants you protected and wants nothing added to what he did. His work on the cross and his resurrection were complete. So I'm coming to you as a daddy, as my little children, and I'm reminding you again of your new birth and how Christ needs to be formed correctly in you. We, as we said last week, remember that uh, none of the Bible books have, were written in chapter and verse. Those were added later for our benefit, but sometimes where they end is a little choppy and it might appear that way here as we close. We'll pick it up next week. But um, look at verse 20. He says, I would like to be present with you. Remember, this is a letter to all of these churches in Galatia. I would like to be present with you. I already said, you haven't hurt my feelings. Um, I've confronted you. I love you. You're my little children. And I would really like to be present with you now and to change my tone. The tone is strong, isn't it? Confrontation has to be that way sometimes but I'd like to be able to change my tone, but look where he leaves us here. For I have doubts about you. Even with everything I've addressed, I would like not to be so harsh. I would not like not to be so challenging. I would like not to have to confront, but I have doubts about you. Someone has invaded you. And as your pastor, as your shepherd, who you used to embrace even when he was ill. They loved him and he loved them, but he wants them to know truth. And that relationship has been broken and he has doubts. What a sad statement for Paul to have to make. I have doubts for you. You know, one of the greatest privileges for a shepherd, for a pastor, is to see people grow and to help them in that process and to lead to the right grass and the healthy things and would certainly warn against the things that aren't healthy. The Bible is our guide for all of that. But there's great joy when you see someone's God, that guy was struggling for a while. Look at him, he's walking with Christ. Or I know his testimony and it was horrible. Now, all the background and Satan was beaten up on him, but look at him now and there's great joy in that. But equally, and this is where Paul's at, when something destructive has happened to a Christian, and you see the downfall and the scars in the aftermath. Paul says that I have doubts for you. I have concerns for you. And I'm hurting for you. Restoration is needed, Paul says. And it only comes by truth, humility, repentance before God and his message. That never changes. This is not a new way that God says, come back to me or come to me for the first time. It always includes that wonderful touch by the Spirit of God and our response to it. I repent. I confess of my sins. I, I don't make excuses for them. And as a result, I can be restored. Oh, he would love to see that in them. And we're going to continue the letter over the next couple of chapters and watch the uh, address and the concern is the shepherd continues to be there. Do you get the idea that Paul never gives up? You can have doubts and you can hurt for someone, but never give up until God says it's done. Never give up on your children. Never give up on your grandchildren. Never give up on people you're ministering to. Just keep praying and say, God, my assignment is to not compromise on truth, but to do it in love. And if I need an adjustment on my approach, please show me but never give up. God is the only one that holds the time clock and he is the one that holds the uh, timing and he will say when it's over. But until then, we have an assignment and Paul was very faithful at it. If you've ever been confronted in your sin, maybe you can understand 
the pain that it brings, but I would equally say if you've ever been restored, and we all have, from your sin, then you can understand the relief. And I always want to look back on those situations and say, I hope they know I love them, but I can't be concerned in the long term about feelings and compromised truth. It would be a lot easier for me to not confront people, but I wouldn't be doing my job. It's not just the pastor, by the way. We do it in the church. We gently love uh, or confront through love, and yet sometimes we avoid that because we don't want to hurt feelings. I don't think you always have to hurt feelings. That's up to God and the other person. But he certainly says never compromise on truth. I'm going to pray for us as we close. I'm going to ask you in our silent time that we take every Sunday to pray as well. And maybe God has just instructed you as we're talking or will in the silent time to just say, hey, you know that individual? You don't have to compromise on my message or, or truth. But I'm going to ask you just to come at it with a little loving approach. A little more than before. Or maybe you might hear God say, hey, you're doing good. Just keep going. Don't worry about emotions. They come and go. Or whatever the Holy Spirit might say to you. But I'm going to pray for us and then enter into a little silent time. And you just hear from God the direction he wants to take. Father, now in our closing moments, as we so often want to do, we don't want to rush out of this place. Whether we've had communion or worship or fellowship we want to hear how this would apply to us so would you do that wonderful work that you do by taking letters that were written years ago inspired by your spirit and inspire us to the application some of us are thinking of a few individuals some of us are thinking of oh boy i messed that up myself some of us have one person in mind whatever it is god would you just move across our midst Spirit of God and comfort us speak to us equip us for the work at hand To be used of God, to sing, to speak, to pray, to be used of God, to show someone the way I long so much to feel the touch of your consuming fire to be used of God is my desire let's sing that again to be used of God to sing to speak to pray to be of God to show someone the way I long so much to feel the touch of his consuming fire to be used of God is my desire hope it's your desire this week God bless you as he guides you and shows you. And I almost forgot to tell you, you're all looking mighty fine today. <laughs> God bless you.